All right. We'll go ahead and welcome in to talk a little bit of Nebraska football. What is going on with Scott Frost, etc.? He is Ravi Lula. He's a contributor to 1620 The Zone in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, you check him out on Twitter, at R-A Lula. That's right, Ra Lula, R-A-L-U-L-L-A. Uh, let's dive into it. All right, I'd love to welcome to the show Ravi Lula. He is a contributor for 1620 in Omaha and uh, it knows a little, little bit here and there about Nebraska football. Uh, I had one of his tweets on the show not that long ago when we were talking about coaching candidates for the Nebraska football job. Ravi, uh, what is going on in Nebraska? It felt like Fred Hoiberg and Scott Frost were both can't miss hires. It's maybe taking a little longer to build up what they want to do. What is what is happening with Scott Frost's football program? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you you brought up both those guys. They were both home runs. I mean, not just locally. I think every. I mean, I didn't even think they could get Hoiberg. Like, I, <laughs> I didn't think that was an option. And when it was like, oh no, this might happen, that was a huge deal. The Frost thing, obviously, he seemed gettable, but it seemed like a home run. It didn't seem like there was any question that this was going to work. I mean, it wasn't just a Nebraska guy getting a Nebraska job. Like Florida wanted him, UCLA wanted him. Like he was the guy in that hiring cycle. And, you know, and I think I realized maybe more than some that his resume was a little lighter than it appeared on paper. Um, He didn't call plays the whole time at Oregon. He had only had the two years, obviously at UCF and, UCF, despite the 0-12, was not in that bad of shape. Like, it was a really smart job for him to take because they were, like, 9-4 and the year before they went 0-12. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, like, they were a really good program for most of the most of the last 20 years, basically. And so he stepped into a really good spot there. And so you're like, okay, maybe the turnaround's not as dramatic as it seems. But even, even having acknowledged that, I still thought it was a home run. It was the hire they had to make. And that's basically the last time anything has gone right for Nebraska and Scott Frost um, was the, was the press conference, you know? Oh yeah. Um, It's been, you know, from the weirdness of his first game getting canceled because of a thunderstorm against Akron back in what 2018 now to starting off. Oh, and six to just all the, there's just been so much weirdness the entire time. And and then the, the COVID season, right? The 2020 season, they were the ones that we want to play. Right, yeah. we we want to do this, and it felt like the Big Ten uh, was a little irritated at them for that. So the scheduling gods didn't exactly help things out with you know scheduling Ohio State really early, and now of course you had the uh, the game in Ireland. It, it's just it's been a mess ever since. It it really has the whole. Th- I mean, yeah, the the COVID season. It's funny that of all the weirdness with Nebraska football, COVID season is like barely in the top five. <laughs> <laughs> um, with what's been going on there. I mean, there's obviously you've got the coaching staff shakeups. You've got so much stuff going on around his, uh, around Scott Frost program. And honestly, I think it all comes back to the head coach. There's been too many other moving parts. There's been too many, um, you know, this he's on his third offensive coordinator now in his fifth year. Um, you know, he's it's a lot out. of interchanging parts. It, it seems he never got real comfortable with his coaching staff. And I wonder if maybe that has a little bit to do with it, but more so this just seems like a coaching issue just from the top down. Every, it seems like there's been pressure at this job ever since he got there. You feel like that's maybe part of the problem. I, yeah. I don't know if it's the pressure or the mix of his pressure, the pressure and his personality. Um, honestly, it's, and this is, my personal opinion, I think he has a hard time taking responsibility for things. Um, (laughs) If you listen to his press conferences, if you talk to people who've been around him at different points in his life or whatever, um, I just don't think he's, I don't, I don't think he takes accountability for things. I, I, you hear him, you know, say that his team is snake bitten or it's like watching the same movie over and over again. It's like, man, you're the director of the movie. (laughs) Like you get to change how it goes. Like you have this every time something goes wrong and last year, a lot went wrong and you know, you had all these one score games and things like that. That's not a coincidence at a certain point. That's kind of baked into the culture of your program. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he doesn't seem willing to take responsibility 
for his role and what's going on. And so why would players take the responsibility for their role and what's going on? Exactly. That press conference of, after the Northwestern game in Ireland where, you know, and he came back and said, no, I wasn't throwing the offensive coordinator under the bus because Whipple has just been through it, right? Uh, yeah. Narduzzi has been bashing him ever since he left Pitt. And now, of course, he goes over, uh, gets what feels like a cush job, but it, still, you've seen him be able to have success, uh, yeah. maybe maybe at the detriment of of the team itself. But, uh, you know, it, he comes out and immediately throws it, talks about being more creative in this league, et cetera. Eh, it's, I don't think the relationship has started off on a, on a good foot to start things off. And then, of course, the North Dakota game last week, it wasn't the offense. It wasn't really one thing. It was just everything. The special teams blunders again, right? That's it. They finally hired a special teams coach and you're still having the same problems. So it just yeah. continues on and on. And that's why I go back to the head coach because, okay, special teams coach, no special teams coach, three different offensive coordinators, whether Frost is calling plays or not calling plays. They thought it was an Adrian problem. They bring in a new quarterback. It's not an Adrian problem. And talking about Adrian Martinez, <laughs> you know, like there's, there's so, there's been so many different parts that have come through here in the last four plus years into year five now that it's hard to put the fin point the finger at anybody else. Yeah. Um, the, the defensive staff has been mostly intact, but the defense up until this year where they were replacing a lot of people and and kind of rebuilding on that side of the ball, the defense was really good last year. The defense has improved steadily over Chenander's time here. And so there's a level of confidence in what Chenander's doing, but especially on offense where Scott Frost is supposed to be this guru and and this offensive genius or whatever. And that's not to say that he is not a good offensive mind in football, but as a head coach, those two things have not gelled. And the fact that he threw Whipple under the bus, whether he says he did or not, um, you know, the fact that he threw Whipple under the bus after game one, when it's not like his offense has lit the world on fire either, you know, it's not like Frost. Oh, yeah. You know, if Frost was doing so good on offense, Whipple wouldn't be here. You know, Whipple <laughs> wouldn't be in the conversation if they had, by the way, I think they only scored 28 points three times last year. With Scott Frost running the running the show there. So, you know, it's not like he's been lighting the world on fire in the Big Ten with his super creative play calling. In fact, most of the time it's he's shot himself in the foot with it. So, you know, the fact that he throws Whipple under the bus, you know, all the other comments I mentioned from from previous years and previous press conferences, I think it comes back to a head coach accountability thing. And until that gets fixed, which I don't know if at this point in your, you know, Scott Frost in his late forties, I don't know if that's something he's going to change about himself at this point in his life, but whether it's with Scott Frost or with a different head coach until that changes, Nebraska football won't change. And now tell me this, it, 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 what about the fan base? Is the fan base still firmly behind him or are they just waiting on the next guy already? I mean, what, what does it look like up there? So it's, it's a roller coaster with the, the way people feel about Frost and the way things have gone when he got hired, obviously everybody was on board, which was a big deal for Nebraska because they'd been super polarized when Frank Solich got fired. Um, most people were pretty okay with Callahan getting fired, but it was super polarizing when Pelini got fired. Everybody, most people hated the fact that Mike Riley got hired in the first place. So it was, it's been an up and down kind of thing with the fan base over 20 years now. And so Frost getting hired, and unifying everybody was a huge deal for uh, the Nebraska fan base. And honestly, people have stuck by him pretty well. It really started to fall apart around Purdue last year. That was the first time I felt like the majority of the fan base had really kind of turned on him. And then when Trev said, hey, we're going to keep him for the rest of the season or for next season, um, you know, people kind of backed off a little bit and cooled off. But man, it was back after Northwestern. It was a pretty... Um, pretty frustrated and angry fan base. Well, as you and, said, it, it was the same movie, right? Yeah, <laughs> over and over. It is. It you was bring almost, in like all these new transfers, and you've got new members on the coaching staff, and it's supposed to be different. And this is a team that they beat by forty nine points last year. Yep. And you went and made all these changes, and now that team has caught up to you in one off season. That's yeah, what it, makes it so weird. Well, so, and that's the that's the thing I keep pointing to with it, it's a head coaching thing, and it doesn't take like it doesn't take this long in college football today. It yeah. doesn't take this long to get good. I mean, Wake Forest got good 
before Nebraska got good again, you know, and, um, you know, Illinois one year under Brett Bielema, they're five and seven, right. That yeah. would match the best year under Scott Frost. Like this isn't, this doesn't take that long. Lovey Smith fell his way into a bowl game, right? <laughs> like on accident. And he had no interest in being there whatsoever. Like this is not something that is hard. Making a bowl game in college football is not hard to do. No, people no, do it on accident. Right. And Nebraska hasn't been able to do that. They have actively been working against themselves to do something that pretty much every team in college football accidentally does over the course of a five or six year period. And that's the thing. Normally a college football team finds an identity at some point. It feels like in year five, we still have no idea what the identity of Nebraska football is other than, you know, that they are going to make a critical mistake at some point in the ballgame. And that's well, the yeah. identity. That's the thing that has really, that's the Northwestern game really made, put that into focus for people. I think was, the way that Pat Fitzgerald called that game down the stretch was, okay, I've got a three-point lead. I'm just going to assume Nebraska can't beat me. And he had, I think, 11 and a half minutes left when he made that decision. They didn't throw another pass the rest of the game. They threw yeah, they went 12 to. straight runs. They <laughs> didn't throw a pass. Even though Holinsky was dicing up the secondary, he's like, I'm just going to let Nebraska screw up. That's what they do. And it, he was right. That's <laughs> yes. the horrible part is the he was right. And so, um, no, they have not found a positive identity for sure um, under Scott Frost, which, again, that's kind of was supposed to be his whole thing. There was supposed to be an identity. There was supposed to be uh, this ability to identify guys that fit the system, and they haven't been able to do that. They haven't developed guys well. Um, they've recruited, for the most part, better than Iowa and Wisconsin. They pretty much always have. There's been a couple years over the last, like, decade where one or two or one or both of those teams have out recruited Nebraska, Nebraska brings in the talent. People always yeah. assume it's a talent issue at Nebraska. It's not, not in the big 10 West. You go up against Ohio state. Yes. There's a <laughs> talent gap there, but in the big 10 West, you've got, you've got the best guns in the big 10 West for the most part. This is a coaching and culture issue to the core. And again, like I said, I, maybe Scott Frost can change his ways. It doesn't seem like he has so far this year. And I'm I'm on the boat that they have to find somebody else who can do it. That's a, so that was what I was wanting to get to it with all the realignment, with all the uh, expansion and whatnot. It, can Nebraska still be a successful football, uh, football program? Now, it, now, I guess the definition would change because sure, I don't know that they're going to be, you know, three national titles in four years kind of program right. again. But being a good top tier Big Ten West team, which in the divisions may go away eventually, but a team that can routinely get to nine wins every other year, right? Ten wins once in four years, something along those lines. But but be making bowl games every season, uh, you would have to believe that Nebraska could do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. For any university that pours the resources into their football program that Nebraska does, I always believe they have a chance to be relevant and be good again. Um, as you said, the definition of, of what relevant and good is matters here. But, you know, if you're, I understand this is all going to change, but assuming the current uh, infrastructure of college football, there's no reason Nebraska can't compete for the Big Ten West every year. Um, are they going to win it every year? No. But to be in that conversation the same way that Iowa and Wisconsin are, they should be in that conversation with them every year. It should be. Iowa, Wisconsin, Nebraska, all kind of vying for the top. And depending on who's got the most guys coming back, who's got the better quarterback, like little things will determine who wins the division in, in that scenario. Not, hey, can Nebraska get over six wins this year? Um, that's <laughs> or at least get no two reason, six wins, right? <laughs> yes, get to a bowl game. There's no reason Nebraska shouldn't be in that scenario. And again, with the resources that they they pour into it. It just takes the right coaching hire and Nebraska hasn't gotten a lot of coaching hires right in the last 20 years, but yeah, since, since Osborne. Yeah. I mean, some people liked Pelini and at least there was a level of consistency there, but people that paid attention know that that wasn't going well. Um, he got blown out in every game that mattered. It's like, yes, he beat the teams he was supposed to, which we would take at this point, but it was not a situation where that that program was progressing at all. Um, but yeah, they they haven't done a good job hiring coaches. But you know, Alabama was really bad at hiring coaches for a long oh, yeah. stretch there too. And not that Nebraska is ever going to turn into what Alabama is now. 
Uh, but you can become relevant with one good coaching hire. I mean, Kansas became relevant with one good coaching hire, you know, like any, as I mentioned, Wake Forest before Wake Forest became relevant with one good coaching hire. It doesn't take that much to turn things around in college football, especially the way the transfer portal is now you can turn over your roster super fast. Um, so yeah, I think Nebraska can be relevant. I think they'd be good. I think they're a long way away from competing for national titles. That's not a, that's not a hot take. That's just, I mean, they're a long way away. <laughs> I don't think they're that far away from making a big 10 championship game. So are they going to get blown out by Ohio state once they get there? Probably, but making a big 10 championship game, I think should be the next kind of after making bowl games and having winning records, that should be the next goal on the list. Because once you're in that conversation of, Hey, let's say we make a big 10 championship game once every three years, right? Somewhere once every three, four years, somewhere in that neighborhood, Right. That's when you can kind of start to build momentum and maybe start reaching for for higher uh, for higher aspirations than that. Because once you're in the Big Ten championship game, especially once the playoff kind of gets reformatted in a couple of years here, you're in the conversation for a national title at that point. Yeah, yeah, and you're at least in a 12 team playoff in that yeah. situation uh, if you can get there. I mean, we saw Michigan State make a playoff, you know, in the four team format. Exactly. So, there's I no mean, reason. Washington. Washington yes. made a like Cincinnati made a playoff. Like there, these are these are achievable goals. And I think we're going to start to look at the college football playoff a little bit more the way we do the NCAA basketball tournament, where, you know, if you make a final four, like that's kind of like a national championship to some, like it, for some pro or even like a sweet 16 for some program. Yeah. Like I, I cover Creighton a ton here in Omaha, like making yeah. a sweet 16 was a huge deal for Creighton. You know, if they made a final four, that would be an enormous deal. It would be as big of a deal almost as winning a national championship. Cause you know, once you get to that final level, it's sort of a coin flip and it, you know, you kind of understand where you are as a program. It's like when, you know, when uh, VCU or George Mason makes a final four, that's a national championship to them. Like that's as big, like that's as big as it gets. Right. Yes. And so uh, I think people are going to start to view a little bit, not quite to the same extent, the college football playoff the same way where, if a Cincinnati or a Central Florida or a Coastal Carolina makes a college football playoff, that's going to, you're going to hang a banner for that. You know, it's not just we have to win the national championship for any of this to mean anything. Once you kind of make that playoff or you make the semifinals of that playoff, then that's a big deal and you get to have pride in that. And Nebraska needs to start taking steps to where that's even possible. Cause right now, it's not. It's not and even close. No, not we're not even, even in the we're not even the stratosphere, right? But I think they're closer to taking those steps if they find the right coach because they're not that far from an Iowa. Iowa was like what one snap away from a college football oh, yeah. playoff, basically, a handful of years ago. Um, Wisconsin has been kind of knocking on that door a little bit. Obviously, they haven't broken through, but they're kind of in that same neighborhood where if they kind of catch lightning in a bottle one year, that could happen. In 20, 2017, uh, they were yeah. right there. If they had won the – I mean, they lost, what, 26-20 to 20 to Ohio State in the in the Big Ten title game? Yeah, and exactly. And they were undefeated. Right. So those are – there. if you can be in that position, which there's no reason at all Nebraska can't be in the same position as Iowa or Wisconsin. And I think that should be the goal. And it feels like they're really far away from that. But how about this? Let's move into the coaching. Let, let's move into the coaching aspect of this. Uh, yeah. What kind of a coach could win in Lincoln? Right. It, you know, I'm looking at your list now that I uh, that I talked about before. You know, you've got for make them say no. You've got Aranda, Kiffin, Whittingham and Peterson. Um, good and gettable Campbell, O'Brien and Kleinman. Uh, you know, what what guy is maybe best suited for this job? To me, like I've got. Three names on here. I've got Stoops, Leipold, and Munkin, and that's mainly to just build that foundation back, mm-hmm. build the culture back. Uh, those aren't guys that are going to just recruit gangbusters, right? And, and Stoops right. has proven he's really good at, at recruiting. Um, but somebody like Mark Stoops, who the SEC East is starting to build up a little more. You're seeing yeah. Tennessee and South Carolina do bigger things. Kentucky took advantage of a down SEC East right. uh, with the change in realignment. With Oklahoma and Texas coming in, you know, Kentucky will still be down there. Now, he's got a fantastic contract. But as we've seen, like Nebraska's in the Big Ten, the money is going to be equal, if not better. uh, But the expectations might be different. That might be a little bit different situation. Who do you think best fits what would work at Nebraska? 
Yeah, so Stoops is a good name. He wasn't on my original list. Um, I would take Stoops in a heartbeat. I do think it's going to be a little harder to pry him away from Kentucky than some people think. seem to think. Um, they are doing a lot of things to try and keep him there. You mentioned he's making almost $7 million a year um, at Kentucky. The big thing for me with, with Stoops is, does he want to be at a football first school? Because Kentucky's never going to be that. Kentucky's basketball till oh, yeah. the day it dies. Like that, and, and they've been fighting about that back and forth, right? Yeah, but, and you, you wonder yeah. some guys care about that more than others. They do, and, yeah. and I don't know how much he cares about that, or if he can just, you know, some people like that. You can kind of fly under the radar. And, oh yeah, and it allowed him time to build his program. It did, yeah. So uh, Stoops would be a good hire. Honestly, my favorite name on the list, and I don't think he's ever leaving Utah, but Kyle Whittingham is like that template of guy. Kills it on the offensive and defensive line and has a culture in place, has shown that he can slowly improve his recruiting um, as he builds successful teams. But he's got an identity. He knows who he is. The thing for me that's been neglected the most at Nebraska is, you know, they thought the quarterback could fix it or they thought a new offensive coordinator could fix it. They haven't had good line play in a very long time on either side of the ball. The defense has been a little better than the offense. But Nebraska, even under Callahan, was putting consistently offensive linemen in the NFL. Now, under Callahan, they were way better in the NFL than they were in college. So that was a different issue. But you have to be able, especially at a place like Nebraska, you have to start on the line of scrimmage. Um, but heck, even that's where Alabama started. Before they oh, started yeah. getting the five-star receivers and the quarterbacks and everything, they won national titles because they dominated the line of scrimmage. I'm not saying Nebraska is going to do that. I mean, that's where you just did it last year. (laughs) Exactly. That's where you have to start, though, for me. And so they've focused. I think Nebraska's focused a lot on other things in the last few coaching hires. And to me, it's got to be about somebody that has a proven record of a implementing a culture and b developing line play in a way that is is sustainable. Because, listen, you may not always have a great quarterback. You may not always have a first round quarterback. If you get your system going, you can get consistently all conference level line play year in and year out. We've seen it at Iowa. We've seen it at Wisconsin. These are things that are that are doable. You know um, who you're who you're describing right now is uh, the Lance Leipold. So I, I, <laughs> I like Lance Leipold. Play. He's yeah. got Nebraska ties, which I think people around here like a lot. Um, how, how about this? Tell me this. Would would Nebraska fans be OK with hiring a coach from Kansas if he's coming off of, you know, a four and eight season or something along those lines? So that's the big issue is obviously went two and ten last year, doesn't have a huge track record at Kansas. I think he's got to have a winning record this year to even be in the conversation. Um, he checks a lot of the boxes. He really does. But the fact of the matter is Nebraska can't really take a risk on this hire. Um, I don't think that's why I like Jeff Monken a lot. I don't think he gets a good look because a too many people are afraid that he'll run strict chip triple option and B too many people are afraid that a success at army won't translate. Um, and I understand both of those. I do. Uh, yeah. If you're in a better position as a program, you can make a little bit of a risky hire. Um, that's why I really like Jamie Chadwell out of coastal Carolina. Oh, yeah. Cause I think, he runs an offense similar to what we would see from Monken at a bigger school. Uh, but Jamie, but it's Chadwell's a different a, type of, it's like a spread option, right? It's, yes. it's, it's yeah. really weird uh, marriage of the spread mixed with that triple option. And uh, what he has done at coastal is awesome. I, I had him on the show last year and he is so much fun. He's insanely, he, obviously he'll win the press conference. Yeah, but you're not worried about winning the press conference, right? Like we we've right. got to get somebody, and he understands line play. I mean, you saw it against Army last week. He does. Yeah, uh, he he knows that that is where it starts, and you can almost fit anybody that comes up in his program into one of those slots, and they will be successful. Like it's he, he would be great, and that's why I like him so much. I think for where Nebraska's at, it's probably a little bit higher risk profile than they want to take at this point. They probably want someone that has some power five experience either as an assistant or as a head coach or or something like that. Um, But I love Jamie Chadwell. He reminds me a lot kind of of what Gus Malzahn did when at his early days in Auburn, when he had quarterbacks that weren't quite as pass proficient. And so they did a ton of motion, a ton of different looks into triple option type spread looks and things like that. But 
Um, the guy that I think is most likely Nebraska ends up with, Kyle Whittingham is my my wish list. But the guy that I think is most likely, and I, I think everybody would be happy with it, is Matt Campbell. Um, he's got a background in offensive line. Uh, he came up as an offensive line coach. Um, obviously, he's had uh, success at Iowa State, which is a really difficult place to win, as we've seen uh, over the course of forever. Um, but Matt Campbell, I think, would both win the press conference. He'd be he'd be acceptable for Nebraska fans, and I think he's a good hire. Um, yeah. So to me, that's probably the guy that is most likely. And I think he's kind of seen that maybe there's a ceiling at, at Iowa state. Um, and that would, I think, open the door for um, him to come to Nebraska. And there's been, listen, there are rumors, but there's rumors that he's open to it. Um, That's, so, I, I've heard the same. I've heard the same. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's totally smoke and mirrors. I think there's something there in the fact that that's why he was in the gettable category because I do think he is gettable. Obviously, Nebraska is going to pay him more than Iowa State does. Obviously, Nebraska has got more resources than Iowa State does. And you've got the conference certainty. Who knows what the Big 12 looks like for you? Exactly. You know, and we know what the Big 10, we know the Big 10 is going to be here. We don't know how many teams it's going to have. We don't know how many, you know, what divisions are going to be like, but we know it'll be one of the two major players in college football. And that, to me, is an opportunity that a lot of coaches would be interested in if they're not in it right now. You have certainly got that right. All right. I have kept you long enough. I certainly appreciate you being here. For anybody that wants to follow him, go follow Ravi at R-A-L-U-L-L-A on Twitter. And, of course, it'll be in the description, so you guys can go and click that link right there. But, Ravi, I got to tell you, uh, I certainly appreciate you joining. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.